I want to thank you for joining us for the webinar entitled, Oncology Nutrition, What's the Point? As part of ACCC's Establishing and Improving Cancer Nutrition Programs in the Community Cancer Programs webinar series. This webinar is supported by Abbott Oncology. Today's webinar series has been designed to provide practical information to help community-based cancer programs develop and enhance cancer nutrition services. Please note that this webinar will be archived online for your reference and to share with your colleagues. I want to provide you with a quick review of the webinar tools for today's session. You will notice on your screen that there is Ask a Question text box located in the lower left corner. This is where you will ask those speaker questions. Please type your question in the box and hit the Submit button. Your questions will only be seen by the speakers. This will allow you to ask questions throughout this presentation and at the end of the session we will also leave time for a Q&A. If you would like to download a PDF version of today's presentation, you can do so by clicking on the drop-down menu located in the upper left corner of the page. At this time, I would like to introduce our presenters for today's webinar. We have Kim Jordan, who is the Manager of Medical Nutrition Therapy Services at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and Heidi Ganser, who is the Nutrition Therapy Director at Minnesota Oncology Hematology. Their bios can be found in the upper left corner of your screen. At this time, I will turn the session over to Heidi. Thank you, Brisanne, and greetings to all. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day. I know everybody is always hectic. And Kim and I want to thank the Association of Community Cancer Centers for the strong support and attention that they have placed on nutrition. It is greatly appreciated in a topic that both Kim and I are quite passionate about, and for all of the oncology dietitians in the nation or in the audience today, we know that you also share that passion. The March, April 2010 edition or excuse me, 2012 edition is a wonderful example of the support as it highlights nutrition therapy. And actually, the ACCC has a strong history of support. And actually, Kim and I had initially wanted to highlight the exceptional articles by Sherry Oakland and Roan Levin in the November-December 2010 oncology issues. And as timing is everything in this world, we are now able to highlight the brand new current edition hot off the press supplement. And this supplement highlights many great dietitians and their work in implementing nutrition programs. And for those of you that have not yet had a chance to review the supplement, it is titled Cancer Nutrition Services, a Practical Guide for Cancer Programs. It can be downloaded free of charge for anyone that would like to uh, view it, and both Kim and I would highly recommend it. And what we found to be so exciting is that there are real-life examples of programs that have had great success and that are thriving. And also, we're going to talk about guidelines today, and the programs that are highlighted actually really follow the guidelines very well. The focus of today's discussion will complement what others have shared about their experience, whether one is in the initial stages of planning a nutrition program or have developed a program and are looking for ways to expand or increase their value-added service. Today, Kim and I will be offering our experience for what it is worth, things that have worked for us, things that haven't, and for areas that we are hoping to improve or expand upon. Many of the authors in the March-April 2012 supplement identified nutrition as one of the top priorities for their patients. This is also the situation at Minnesota Oncology, and we have a wonderful survivorship program, and in 2012, patients that were involved with the survivorship program noted nutrition to be a greater concern when compared to physical status, fatigue, or emotional concerns. And of course, we recognize that all these may be interrelated, but nutrition concerns were noted to be listed ahead of financial, employment, living will, and other concerns. And as a dietitian, even I was surprised at that. So if you are trying to implement a program or considering implementing a program, we are going to spend a little bit of time on the current standards because these are going to be the basis, the foundation of any program that you hope to implement. And dietitians are now required by many national programs if certification is desired. So if somebody asks, do you really need a dietitian, just refer to the regulations and suggested guidelines. And also, I'd like to point out, if you would refer to Barbara Grant's article in the supplement on page 6 to 10, titled The Evolution of Cancer Nutrition and Its Role, this is a great example of where we were and how far we have come. So I really encourage people to review that. So the Association 
of Community Cancer Centers, or the ACCC guidelines, are newly updated. And to view them in their entirety, please refer to page four and five of the ACCC supplement. And in addition to the guidelines, there's information in regards to the rationale and the characteristics of each guideline. And today I'm just going to cover the main guidelines. So guideline number one, a nutrition professional is available to work with patients and their families, especially patients identified at risk for having nutrition problems or special needs. It should be pointed out that this updated guideline specifies that the nutrition professional is a registered dietitian and maintains registration through the Commission on Dietetic Registration, or the CDR. Certification in Oncology Nutrition as a CSO or Certified Specialist in Oncology Nutrition through the CDR is recommended, and that is huge since we've only had the CSO status since 2008. The ACCC has its finger on the pulse. So this guideline also specifies that staffing of nutrition professionals is adequate to meet the needs of cancer patients and their families in a timely manner. Guideline number two, the nutrition professional with patient, family, and the oncology team manages issues involving the patient's nutrition and hydration status through appropriate nutrition screening, assessment, and intervention across the care continuum. This guideline specifies the need for a screening process to identify and prioritize patients at risk for malnutrition, and we will be discussing this more in depth later. And this guideline also identifies the need to utilize anticipatory guidance, in other words, proactive versus reactive care. And I know a lot of times people say, well, you don't need to see the dietitian yet. This guideline specifies being proactive. Guideline number three, the nutrition professional serves as a resource and provides nutrition and diet information about reducing cancer risk and cancer recurrence through educational programs, materials, and services to the community. This guideline highlights the need to educate for educational materials, programs, and services provided to the community. <clears throat> and again, please refer to the ACCC supplement for wonderful examples of what people are doing in this regard. And again, Kim and I will also be addressing what we're doing um, a little bit later. Guideline four, the nutrition professional manages nutrition and diet related needs specific to each patient's individual survivorship plan. And again, the survivorship role is truly growing. And we just wanted to point out that the ACCC Nutrition Advisory Panel, working to update the cancer program guidelines, believe that it was important to establish what comprises best practice nutrition care. They do recognize that some community cancer programs may not employ dietitians or have access to the services they provide. And Virginia Vining had an excellent article in the supplement, page 20 to 23, that points out that there may be dietitians in an area or in a rural area that may just wish to work part-time or flexible or perhaps job share that might fill the need. And for those dietitians that don't have a lot of access or support, it would be helpful to make available a list of comprehensive resources that were provided on page 37 to 40 of the supplement. The American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer, Cancer Program Standards 2012, these are also recently updated. The Oncology Nutrition Practice Group of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has actually been a member organization of the American College of Surgeons since 1995. But late last year, representatives of the COC Standards Committee, the ONDPG, and the Quality Assurance Department of the Amer Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics established new cancer program standards for nutrition services in its accredited institutions. The guideline specifically states, nutrition services are essential components of comprehensive cancer care and patient rehabilitation. These services provide safe and effective nutrition care across the cancer continuum, which includes prevention, treatment, and survivorship, and are essential to promoting quality of life and adequate spectrum of services is available, which includes screening and referral for nutrition-related problems, comprehensive nutrition assessment, nutrition counseling, and education, either on-site or by referral, and with a procedure in place to ensure patients' awareness and access to services. Beginning in 2012, a dietitian is now a required member of the Cancer Committee for Integrative Network Cancer Programs and is strongly encouraged but not required for all other types of COC accredited cancer programs. The Joint Commission requires that nutrition screening must occur, screening must occur within 24 hours in the inpatient setting on admission or within 14 days of admission to a long-term care facility 
and during the initial nursing visit in home care and hospice settings. And I am no longer within a hospital setting, but for my last survey, the Joint Commission was looking for the policy that we had in place as far as referrals to the outpatient oncology dietitian, and they were making sure that we were following. So I always want to make sure, know what your policy is and follow what you have in place as your policy for the Joint Commission. So why use an oncology dietitian in the oncology setting? It seems like it is a no-brainer. But oncology dietitians have the experience, training, and tools to maximize nutrition outcomes in cancer treatment. Oncology dietitians are uniquely qualified. And some of the following that people in the audience that aren't dietitians might not be aware of, they have specialty in the following. Management of nutrition support, tube feeding or TPN, and the appropriateness of nutrition support. They can estimate the needs for wound healing and suggest possible vitamin or mineral supplementation and if it's appropriate with treatment. They assess the impact that treatment, which may include surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or a combination of these, may have on digestion and absorption of nutrition. They are able to assess the effective use of nutrition supplements. It is not a cookie cutter approach. Although we love our reps, our boost, enter, and carnation, but not all patients require supplementation, such as a breast cancer patient or prostate cancer patient, for example. Oncology dietitians assess the need for pancreatic enzymes and also very helpful in looking at the dosage to make sure that they are effective. They coordinate treatment of diet with comorbidities. Oftentimes patients will come and say, I have diabetes or I've got celiac or renal disease. Which diet is more important? The oncology dietitian is able to look at the whole picture to best meet the needs of the patient. And oncology dietitians have their fingers on the pulse of any product such as tube feeding or nutritional supplements for those patients that do not have insurance. We work really closely with the DME companies and we usually do have a stash somewhere to help these patients, but it truly is amazing. And as everybody knows, the need is great. Oncology dietitians encompass all aspects of care, nutrition and diagnosis, treatment, after treatment, and survivorship. And finally, something that is very common with oncology dietitians, the evaluation and counseling in regards to these complementary strategies. Supplements, diet theory, Therapy such as Gerson, Budwig, juicing, all we know very well, as well as providing information on the evidence-based research of some of the integrative standard strategies such as anti-inflammatory diet. In regards to supplement use, dietitians are able to see if they are appropriate or if the purity and potency of the supplements, which might also be an issue. Um, sometimes supplements come from countries that are unreliable in their oversight, and this is a very important consideration. And just a plug for joining the Oncology Nutrition Practice Group, included in the membership is access to the Natural Medicine Comprehensive Database, which I know a lot of the dietitians utilize. So in 2008, the Commission on Dietetic Registration began administering and granting the CSO, Certified Specialist in Oncology, credential for dietitians specializing in oncology nutrition and working in the cancer care setting. CDR defined oncology nutrition practice as dietitians working directly with individuals at risk for or diagnosed with any type of malignancy or pre-malignant condition in a variety of settings such as hospitals, clinics, cancer centers, hospices, public health, or indirectly through roles in management, education, industry, research practice linked specifically to oncology nutrition. To become eligible to be board certified, an individual must first possess the RD credential, must maintain current RD status by CDR, maintenance of RD status with CDR for a minimum of two years, documentation of 2,000 hours practice experience as an RD in oncology nutrition within the past five years. Certain education and professional experience can be used as a substitute for the required 2,000 hours required. Certification period is for five years, and the CSO exam is offered twice a year. And currently there are just under 500 CSOs, 483 at the last count, although Here's hoping we have some new minted diet or CSOs in the near future. And I would encourage any of those dietitians in the audience who are eligible to sit for the CSO exam, I would encourage them to apply for that. Um, the application 
well, currently we're in a phase, March 5th through the 23rd is going on right now, and the next test is September 10th through the 28th. The application will be due June 6, 2012, and an application is available um, at cdrnet.org. Uh, so if you are trying to find an oncology dietitian, all you have to do is log on to the oncologynutrition.org website and search under certification, then find a CSO and see if you have an oncology dietitian in your area. And that's always a very good place to start. So oncology dietitians can bring powerful impact, and as mentioned, in this day and age, we are always looking for value-added services. And I just wanted to point out an excellent study by Lee et al. And actually, Carol Haverla, one of the oncology dietitians, was a co-author on this study. They looked at 79 head and neck cancer patients. 40 were retrospective, and 39 were involved with a uh, supplement program. The nutrition intervention, all the patients in the study were followed closely by the dietitian. Nutrition counseling involved monitoring weight weekly, a comprehensive nutrition assessment, and individually tailored device, advice was utilized. All the patients were encouraged to use the supplements, and the dietitian recommended a specific amount of supplementation based on estimated calorie protein needs, and they did review uh, the recommendation with the patient on a weekly basis. Patients were provided with free supplement, and it was Enter Plus in this case. The patients that received the free supplement, this was associated with a 40% relative reduction in weight loss, 6.1 compared to 10.1% that did not receive the supplement. It also was associated with a decreased need for PEG-2 placement, 31% versus 6% in the patients that utilized the free supplement. Cost savings, they had negotiated a price of $5.25 per case, one case per week estimated for 8 to 12 weeks. Total cost, $50 to $75 compared to the average cost of a peg tomb placement, which is for somebody about 60 years of age, average $2,200. Enteral formula, $8.52 per day, $3,000. So if you look at $3,000 compared to $50 or $75, these are the kind of studies that are going to show the impact and the benefit of having an oncology dietitian within the program. And I also just want to briefly, I don't have it up here, but mention another study by McCollum et al. It documented that pancreatic cancer patients that had received nutrition education and counseling by a dietitian, oncology dietitian, at a cost of approximately $185 did not have any intestinal obstruction complications when compared to 71% of patients that did not receive dietary instruction and subsequently developed intestinal obstructions. The average length of stay was 13 days in the hospital at a cost of $7,500 per patient. So when you take those cost savings, $7,500 compared to $185, again, another great way to show the benefit of oncology nutrition if you're trying to get support for your oncology program. Now, this is a very old study. It's actually 1980 by DeWise. It included over 3,000 patients, and I want to thank Abbott Nutrition for allowing us to utilize the visual slide. I was delighted to see that Barbara Grant mentioned this in her article in the March-April supplement, and here it is visually, and it does make quite an impact. The results revealed that study participants that experienced the greatest weight loss had lower median survival time when compared to those without weight loss. And this is a study that perhaps provided the pivotal shift in thinking about nutrition and the need to be proactive versus reactive. And I have... I want to compare and contrast two case studies from where I work. Dave W., and this is perception is everything and education is essential. Dave W. is a 48-year-old male, HPV positive, or pharyngeal cancer. He has status post-surgery and bilateral radiation. He did not require chemotherapy. He did not have a feeding tube in place. Height, 6 foot 2, weight at diagnosis, 274, and I can hear the dietitians cringing now. Weight at completion of treatment, 182 pounds, 274 to 182. The MD wrote that the patient is, quote, doing awfully well, unquote. Patient reports that his weight is, quote, stable, unquote. I am not a mathematician, <laughs> but I do not believe that 274 to 182 qualifies as stable. 
So the dietitian actually met with this patient six months after treatment, and he was still losing weight and pretty much surviving on a nutritional supplement that incorporates 560 calories. And so just to go through and identify late effects of treatment, it was really important for this patient, but again, to say that the weight was stable and that he's doing well with that much of a weight loss, ah, oh, my heart. So let's compare that to Robert T., a 68-year-old male who was diagnosed actually in 2004 with esophageal GE junction cancer. He has gone through multiple treatments. He's on his fifth line currently. And in 2010, he had a J2 placed because of complete obstruction. And he has been monitored closely by the oncology dietitian. Height, five foot, five foot five. Weight at diagnosis was 150.8, and that was in 2004. His current weight as of last week, 159.8. He is utilizing Isosource 1.5 via his J2 with a pump. And this gentleman is Mr. Compliant. He continues to maintain a very active life. He goes to church every day, cribbage. He goes to the casinos. And actually, he recently asked to have his tube feeding decreased as he is feeling he is gaining too much weight. And his quote was, my pants are meant for a weight of 150, not 160. <laughs> okay, this is Kim Jordan. And um, as Heidi mentioned, there are several reasons to use an oncology-savvy dietitian not only to save money, but to save human suffering. Um, the first example that Heidi used where the gentleman lost nearly uh, 100 pounds um, is indicative of someone who may not realize that their quality of life uh, has changed, but it could have been much different as with the second example if a nutrition had been involved. One particularly memorable statement that I'd like to share with you that I heard from a cancer patient and caregiver recently was, it would have been much more humane if the doctor had told us nutrition services were available from the beginning. And this really struck me. Like, number one, yes, we should be involved from the beginning. And number two, how much some patients understand that we can help them, nutrition can help maintain a quality of life. When building or enhancing a nutrition program, it is really important to at least work towards a model that includes nutrition from the very beginning. Ideally, nutrition should be treated as an adjuvant therapy, and it supports key outcomes for cancer patients. And these include healing from and tolerating treatment. Nutrition helps to keep healthy cells healthy, and it includes those healthy cells include those of the GI tract, which are affected by every kind of cancer therapy. Um, we, nutrition can help avoid complication, and this includes both acute complications such as infections. One study by Russo et al. suggested that for every one day that radiation therapy was interrupted, there may be a 1% reduction in tumor control rate, and this is a huge impact. Infections, mucositis, dehydration, these are all nutrition-related complications that can be avoided or minimized. There's also chronic complications that nutrition can help avoid, such as heart disease, metabolic syndrome, and type 2 diabetes. At my facility, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, we recently completed several outcome studies that revealed to us that over half of both our adult and pediatric transplant patients developed either metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes after treatment. Well, from this information, we are now currently developing interventions to address this. We're obviously going to try to intervene um, even sooner, um, pre-transplant, and we'll be monitoring the success of these new interventions and making adjustments as necessary. As Heidi said, we're all in a learning curve, some of us further along than others, but this is something that um, I think is essential in any program is to be able to measure how well you're doing. Another key outcome that nutrition can help support is to optimize the, re the patient's response to treatment. With proper nutrition, the response to treatment improves, at the very least because it allows the body's own anti-cancer mechanisms to work. Now, we also help patients maintain a functional capacity and quality of life, and I think that the um, 
the uh, quote that I began with, the that it would have been more humane to include nutrition at the beginning sort of illustrates that. We can help people uh, be more active, just feel better all around, not only do during treatment but after. But in order to achieve these key outcomes to a significant degree, nutrition intervention should be implemented as early as possible, as I said, ideally from the time of diagnosis. However, in, in most current programs, this isn't often done because Overt nutrition-related symptoms like that we usually think of as trigger mechanisms for a referral to a dietitian don't usually manifest early on, or there are others that are not seen for the red flags that they actually are. Um, the dietitians in the audience and perhaps other professionals in the audience will note that unfortunately reversing issues or repleting the patient is much harder than avoiding the problems in the first place. And I think in order to better understand why nutrition should be treated as an adjuvant therapy rather than a symptom management tool, we all need to have a cellular perspective to remember that the black box in which cancer treatment occurs is based on human biochemistry, which is in turn based on nutrition. And that's why you're going to hear Heidi and I say over and over again, the proactive approach is best. The proactive approach is more like an adjuvant therapy. Reactive is the symptom management. The malnutrition that's, oops. The malnutrition that is uh, present in over half of cancer patients even before diagnosis sets the stage for less than optimal outcomes. But even without prior nutrition issues, treatment-related toxicities can severely impact both nutrition intake and nutrition absorption and utilization. Cancer patients especially are prone to muscle catabolism, even with adequate protein and calorie intake. This slide graphically illustrates one case where significant lean body mass was lost despite the patient maintaining a stable weight. You can see that, I, I, that the average total loss was 6.8 kilograms. Now, that is significant, and yet, it's relatively low weight loss given uh, a lot of cancer patients. But you can see by the picture, the MRI images, that there has been a profound change in body composition. And in fact, this, is, this occurred, as I said, even with a stable energy and protein intake. Cancer patients, as well as many oncologists and other cancer therapy providers, are unaware that the majority of weight lost during cancer treatment is lean body mass. Um, and this occurs whether the patient is normal weight or obese or whether they gain weight during therapy, uh, as well as those who lose it. The body composition changes can really factor into cancer progression. Not only cancer progression, but those body changes can really factor into many of the chronic effects of treatment, such as heart disease, metabolic syndrome, or type 2 di diabetes. In fact, a lot of times it can be traced, those uh, complications can be traced back to the body composition changes. The changes drive negative metabolic effects both during treatment and after. And we know that metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease are not only expensive to manage for, you know, whether it's a can in a cancer survivor or in the general population, but they're also, they also have a significant and negative impact on quality of life for cancer survivors. So in order to avoid these composition changes, really, the inter we know that the interventions have to be implemented early. This is, once again, a reason to make nutrition a part of the process from as early a point as possible, being proactive versus reactive. And this is Heidi again. <clears throat> Implementing nutrition early is easier if there is a strong screening tool in place. And oncology dietitians tend to have the ability to prioritize those patients that we know are going to be at risk. And it was really heartwarming to see that so many of the authors in the supplements noted that there were a screening process in place and that had indicated patients that would be considered high risk or an automatic referral. 
And some of those noted in the articles included head and neck cancer, gastric, pancreatic, liver, colorectal, esophageal, and lung cancer patients. All of these patients are at risk for significant issues in regards to their nutritional status prior to treatment even beginning. And as Kim mentioned, up to 50% are already um, having issues before they're diagnosed. And so all of these diagnoses that I just mentioned would be considered automatic referrals at Minnesota Oncology, but we also note an automatic referral if a patient has TPN or tube feeding, and also if they've had a significant weight gain, not just a weight loss. And we wanted to point out a few tools, and I apologize, we don't have the link for the seventh vital sign. Um, this was actually just highlighted in the supplement um, by Rowan Levin, and we just wanted to point it out because we thought that it was really neat. It was a quick, easy um, tool. The Mountain States Tumor Institute developed the malnutrition screening tool. It's termed the seventh vital sign, and it's a simplified version of the malnutrition screening tool. While the patient is being weighed, they are asked if they have had a decrease in the appetite, and if the patient answers yes and any weight loss has occurred, a weight loss screen referral is sent to the Nutrition Services Department. And we also want to point out we think that's a great tool, very much so, but as I just mentioned, the weight gain is also a concern, so obesity is strongly associated with cancer. In several cancers, we know that the weight status, the diagnosis, and weight gain during treatment is associated with poor outcomes yet weight gain is frequently overlooked as a trigger for the dietitian. So with this or any other screening tool, please consider the mix of cancers in your facility. If you have a significant amount of prostate or breast cancer cases, uh, please consider using unintentional weight change rather than just weight loss as a trigger. Um, I think probably most are familiar with the patient-generated subject Subjective Global Assessment, or the PGSGA. It is validated for use in the oncology population and was developed by Dr. Faith Ottery. It does have 17 data points and contains both screening and assessment criteria. And I have to admit, it does look a little daunting, but it's really not um, a tough tool to use. Patients complete the first four sections, nurses score the answers, and patients that are above three should be scheduled for a nutrition consult. And I noted in um, Keele Trentham's um, article as well, it is challenging because if the patients are completing this, we send it out with our initial patient packet, and sometimes it gets lost in the shuffle with our EMR. Um, the other dietitian and myself are often trying to find it, so there have been some challenges. Um, it is a good tool, but you have to continue to educate people on its use. Um, the mini nutrition assessment has 18 data points, contains both screening and assessment criteria, also known as the MNA. The malnutrition screening tool has two data points and it is utilized purely as a screening tool. And I wanted to point out precachexia. As Kim had just mentioned, doing some of the outcome studies and catching patients being proactive versus reactive, and again, there's a theme here, but I know we all know that, but sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, the definition, this is a really new definition, and it was recently identified, and there's been some consensus statements um, put out by Farron et al., Donahue, if anybody um, is curious. But precachexia is defined based on the presence of all the following, an underlying chronic disease, unintentional weight loss of less than or equal to 5% of usual body weight during the last six months. And when you compare this to the usual 5% in one month, 7.5% in three months, and 10% in six months, that is really catching patients very early if it's less than 5% or equal to, or less than 5% within the last six months. There also has to be a chronic or recurrent systemic inflammatory response, which could be measured by checking C-reactive protein, impaired glucose tolerance, anemia-related inflammation, and also anorexia or anorexia-related symptoms. And at Minnesota Oncology, we are considering um, implementing a pilot program utilizing the symptom-based assessment anorexia tool fact questionnaire. There's 12 questions that would identify anorexia and looking at the precachexia criteria. And the hope is to prevent or delay changes in body composition, nutrition complications that are linked to chronic disease, and to be following these patients to see if there is less delay in treatment, less hospitalization, less need for IVs, those sorts of things. So the outcome studies, again, are going to be really important and if you're trying to show the value of the service, that is one way to do it. So building a program. Again, we cannot say it enough. There is definitely a theme here. The supplement from the ACCC has exceptional information about building programs. 
and it was so exciting to see how many programs had not only been initiated, but that were thriving and growing. And at Minnesota Oncology, we started with one that would be me, <laughs> full-time dietitian, for nine clinics. And I think, you know, I'm fairly quick, but one dietitian for nine clinics. And then we grew to 1.6, now we're at 2.0, and we're hoping to increase to 2.5. And the eventual goal and the vision was to have at least one full-time dietitian at each clinic. And for those that are on the ground, and whether you're social workers, nurses, dietitians, for you on the front line, you know that in your day-to-day -day work, it is really important to have adequate staff if you ever hope to expand a program. You have to have the man and woman power to do so, and again, if we can show the benefit, increase the program value-added service, that will really help. And so to grow or even start a program, to find your key players, buy-in is key. Who is a champion of your cause? And I know at Minnesota Oncology, this just recently happened. We have a great survivorship nurse who completely has filled my schedules. I was booked three weeks out from one nurse who is a huge champion of my cause, and I greatly appreciate it. And Roan Levin actually put it very nicely. One must have a culture of nutrition. And again, that's anybody in the program that whether it's radiation therapy, like in my case, radiation therapy techs are always bringing patients to my attention, but anybody can identify patients that they're concerned about or at risk, or, and nurses are fabulous with this. But of course, if you're going to have a successful program, you have to have buy-in from all, from the top down and the bottom up. And some examples of top down administration, CEO, CFO, your business team, the physicians, and Minnesota Oncology is a physician-owned service, and so they really are key players and they truly support the service. The Cancer Committee, which now we are required to be part of, <laughs> is a great place to start as well. And I would highly recommend, and I know sometimes dietitians tend to be a little bit shy, not all, I know a lot of bold dietitians, but to invite yourself to the physicians meeting, the Cancer Committee, well now you have to go, and the administration. Tell them what you can do for them, what value-added service you can provide to them. They have always been more than willing to listen, and they're very interested. So definitely take that step. For nursing, we love the nurses as oncology dietitians. They are highly significant in this process. They are the driving force behind order writing. And although our physicians, I'm sure this is not just to Minnesota Oncology, love the service, but they usually assume that their nurses have taken care of scheduling the appointments and automatic referrals don't automatically happen. And I know Kim has also expressed the same at Seattle Cancer Care. You have to educate, educate, and educate some more. As there's always turnover of nursing staff or other staff, and so education is an ongoing continual process. And I always say I'm taking my dog and pony show on the road again. And anytime there's a new program or a change in a process, you have to go out and educate everybody, send out emails, send out notices so that they're aware. And in our program, schedulers, truly, you know, for me, they're very important. I don't schedule my own appointments. And I've provided talking points for the staff so they can sell or market the service because sometimes patients will say, you know, I don't really need to see the dietitian yet. But if you tell them why, it actually helps. And so the other thing, the bottom up, patients need to be educated. A lot of times patients might say, I'm not sure why I'm seeing you, and then it's really important to educate them on the benefit of early nutrition, how it will impact their outcomes by preventing delay in treatment or hospitalizations. And we also go to the welcome classes or we provide literature that helps patients to understand the benefit of nutrition, and it can be invaluable because it's not acceptable to hear the patient's saying, well, the patient isn't having problems yet. Why do they need to see you? That is exactly the point. Oncology and nutrition, what's the point? That is the point. We don't want them to have problems. We don't want them to have that 100-pound weight loss. That is not acceptable. So to have a solid process in place, if you have not had the opportunity, I would highly recommend that you look at the Oncology and Nutrition Standard of Practice and Standards of Professional Performance by Robin et al., and it's a wonderful tool that helps to define basic knowledge of what an oncology dietitian does compared to specialty or an advanced practice dietitian. And it really does help um, 
focus, um, and it's a wonderful tool. And as we mentioned, provider collaboration as well. As we've been saying all along, we really want uh, you all to consider making nutrition a part of the process from the beginning. One of the ways that you can do that is with sort of automatic referrals. And Heidi mentioned that, you know, some of the uh, diagnoses that she had at Minnesota Oncology as sort of automatically f referred to see the dietitian. But the truth is, that automatic referrals aren't really automatic. Someone has to identify the patient to be at risk. And using, like um, Heidi was talking about, using certain diagnoses that we know to be high acuity, such as head and neck cancers, GI cancers, or lung cancer, um, is a good way. And at uh, SCCA, we use uh, what's called standing orders, where the orders are already written if the patient has that diagnosis, and it's already been signed off on by a, the committee of physicians for that particular service, that they agree that this is exactly what they want to have happen automatically, then no one needs to remember except to pull that standing order sheet. So that helps. Also, um, we have or are currently developing nutrition treatment protocols for each cancer service area. And what we're hoping to do here is not only um, outline what the interventions are, but we are developing an algorithm for staff that will go with these about when and how much nutrition intervention is appropriate. We're hoping these will not only um, act as a guide for staff and offer standardization, but they'll also serve as an ongoing education tool. As Heidi said, educate, educate, and educate some more. Now, as a, my little soapbox uh, about standardization, having standardized protocols will help you create outcome studies much more easily because you'll be comparing apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. And I think that's really important, not just for each individual organization, but for us as a whole, for cancer treatment facilities, uh, centers um, across the U.S. because uh, as we grow, we can use these outcome studies to help each other develop best practices. Okay, in the essence of time, I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit, but, you know, for marketing the service, it's very, very important. Patients, again, may decline, and at Minnesota Oncology during the chemo class, um, oftentimes they'll say as part of the standard orders, we'll schedule a nutrition consult, and patients do have the ability to opt out, but by educating the nurses, the schedulers, and giving them the bullet points that we mentioned, the importance of nutrition during treatment, um, we have a great system in place to see patients early. When the staff understand how nutrition fits in beyond the usual symptom management, they can act as wonderful advocates. So patients also respond to hearing that consistent message. At Minnesota Oncology, we've got brochures and flyers and posters. Our pictures are everywhere. You cannot <laughs> go in a room without seeing one of the dietitian's pictures. And so we are able to see patients at all of our clinics. And so that has been helpful, I think, for customer service. Um, we utilize our website. We note nutrition services and discuss the benefit of our services. And also, um, for we're one of the only oncology programs in the Twin Cities area outpatient setting as far as oncology care with the exception of um, one or two others. So, Also, the website is a great marketing tool and it can um, operate as an additional support for your patients. At SCCA, we had some patient focus groups that named this type of resource as a top priority. Patients feel like with all the appointments they have to make, they have a lot of scheduling pressures. Having access to reliable information 24-7 online was really valued as a way that um, medical nutrition therapy services could support them at any hour. And it takes resources to develop this kind of web page, but it's really worth the effort because not only internal marketing and support, but when patients Google you know, cancer nutrition, your page can come up, and we've actually had several new patients come to SCCA as a result of our web page. And as, if people are savvy out there, people can also be on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, but also recognize the 
potential risk there, but for good nutrition information. And at Minnesota Oncology, although you're never on hold for long, there is a nice voice message loop that discusses all the services that are provided to Minnesota Oncology patients, and that does include um, nutrition services. And then with closed caption TV, sometimes this can be used in waiting rooms. It could have good information for slides, nutrition notes, short videos. That can be a very good marketing tool as well. And at Minnesota Oncology, we do have all new nurses shadow us, and also we also have pharmacy um, students follow as well. They definitely gain a better understanding of what it is that we do, and they become our best referral sources. And if shadowing is not possible, try to be a regular again at their nursing meetings if possible or CEU events, but just to be out there. It, whether it's a chemo class, orientation class, again, you want to be visible, which actually last Friday I was off in a corner working on some things. Everybody thought I was off. So definitely if you are in a clinic, be out, be visible. Go say hello to the nurses and the doctors, and you will really become part of the team. But if you're sitting back in a corner, People won't even know you're there, so just get out there and be visible. Okay, those wishing to uh, build or enhance a nutrition program should also realize the opportunity that's inherent with the Joint Commission and CMS's new emphasis on patient-centered care and the mandate to measure patient satisfaction as a reflection of this. Nutrition services are really valued by patients. and. I mentioned that SCCA had done some focus groups, but we've also recently done an in-depth patient survey, and it revealed that nutrition was at the top of patients' with wish lists, which I thought was amazing, and obviously Heidi's facility found the same thing. But it was also listed as a key component to their overall satisfaction with their cancer treatment services as a whole. I think nutrition really offers patients the chance to be proactive in their own healing and to feel as if they're doing their part as a member of their own medical team. And this can give them a really positive focus and an area of control in a situation in which they often feel out of control. I think it's also important to note that while there's lots of nurses and providers that try to help the patients with their nutrition issues, their time and expertise is really better suited and used in other areas. So leaving nutrition to the RD really frees up valuable time. Now, time also uh, is valuable for the dietitian. So I think that making sure that you utilize uh, your, your dietitian time well means that you um, actually hook up and partner with um, the community. And the community means partnering like with lo local healthy food stores. I'm calling them healthy food stores rather than health food stores. Um, and doing things like cooking classes, et cetera. The, this slide shows one of my um, staff events here. Those are my two dietitians up giving a survivorship cooking demonstration to about 300 people, which takes a lot of time and energy. However, what we've also done is partnered with a local consumer co-op that um, it has nutrition trained staff that actually take our patients on a grocery store tour and um, at the end of the tour they give them uh, samples of foods and at the end of the tour they give them a $10 gift certificate so that they can shop and um, everybody wins. The dietitian gets some time off, the uh, patients get to try something new and get a, a a gift card and the store gets a little PR. We also have a way of hooking patients up, whether they're in active treatment or survivorship, with uh, community supported agriculture and farmers markets. We've also um, been able to really help out both in treatment and uh, survivorship patients with cancer specific retreats. If you have um, local spas or other wellness oriented oriented um, businesses in your area, try and work with them to create these kind of events. The one that's listed on this slide is Harmony Hill Cancer Retreat Center. It's not really just a cancer retreat center, but they have put together 
offer, along with help from us, a three-day extended retreat for uh, cancer patients that has been really, really popular, and patients really um, view them in a positive manner. It uh, took some work on our end initially, but it's really extended the reach of my dietitians. Remember that any robust nutrition program is going to have to have a survivorship pop um, component. Actually, um, patients desire and standards require that we address this population, and it's growing at an unprecedented rate. Um, actually, nutrition is also at the top of the list of patient concerns for survivors, as well as, uh, we've, as we've said previously, patients in active treatment. But there's no reason for you to reinvent the wheel. Again, partner with the community. Um, we use our YMCAs to create nutrition and exercise programs uh, for our survivorship. Um, we are also developing sort of multimedia media, things on our web page, and um, a, a specific survivor um, wellness uh, web page as well. There's a lot of resources available. We'll say it again, like Heidi said, it's a theme. The ACCC supplement that recently came out has an enormous number of resources uh, on pages 37 through 40. Survivorship programs are important. As I said, the standards require them. But one of the things that it states is that we need to individualize the plan. That can involve a one-on-one -on -one visit or many with the dietitian. Um, but it, it means taking a look and coming up with a plan for the patients that includes um, if they have any cor comorbidities or lab values that really need to be addressed, such as a low vitamin D, et cetera. But Heidi does something else in her survivorship program that I thought was pretty interesting. Heidi, can you describe that? Sure. We use the review metabolic testing. I've probably done about 20 or 24 already this year and it's for weight management because obviously we don't want them to lose during treatment, but it checks their actual resting energy expenditure and we do utilize it for weight management, the breast cancer patients, and it gives them good information whether their metabolism is slow, normal, or fast, and so it's been really helpful to help with the weight management goals. And that, that, those tend to be real issues. Behavior, lifestyle behavior changes is really hard. And so um, teaming up in a multidisciplinary approach to create maybe lifestyle intervention classes or a total program is really a great idea. But if you can't do that, then at least go out into the community and know what support groups there are, help create them, and if, if there's nothing else, provide the patient with a list of maybe online support that they can get. And we are going to take our own advice, not reinvent the wheel. Um, please check out the ACCC supplement. Again, it can be downloaded for free, page 37 to 40. Excellent examples, great resource, professional information, and patient resources. Okay. And here we are finally at the finish line. Um, the takeaways are mainly you are not alone. There's a lot of great support out there from ACCC and the membership. There's a lot of literature that can help guide you in creating your program, and the standards can help guide you. So definitely take a closer look at those. The standards can not only guide you, but as we stated previously, they can support you, for example, in, uh, in uh, supporting how much staff you need, etc. We really encourage you to work towards an integrated model in your nutrition program that uh, requires nutrition intervention to start early and that goes all the way through survivorship. Remember to educate everyone on the importance of nutrition as an adjuvant therapy and get buy-in from the top down and bottom up. Market yourself at what, or, or that program at any time, any place that seems appropriate, and don't reinvent the wheel. Use the resources that you've already got at hand here from ACCC and other reliable sources. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Heidi and Kim. At this time, we'll take a, a couple of minutes to answer a few questions. For those questions not answered, we will put together an FAQ and post them on the nutrition website. So we can go ahead and start with the first one. Um, 
what if a patient what if a patient has a demineralization of the head of the femur from chemotherapy? What would you add other than increasing the D three? Heidi, you do you want to answer that or Sly? Go ahead. Um, I would have to say that I would need to know a whole lot more about this patient <laughs> before I could even begin to answer this because there are so many other factors that could be involved here. It could be that uh, we're talking about um, this not just being a D3, but other um, factors in bone mineralization that the patient is um, deficient in. So. I would be happy to help with that question offline, but I think we don't have enough time to uh, address it right here. Okay. So we'll go ahead into the next one. Um, do you bill for your services? This goes to both of them. Actually, I will take that question. Um, Kim and I decided not to even cover that because that is a whole topic on itself, but I would highly recommend that people consider going to the oncology nutrition um, symposium in Dallas, if you're able to, um, at the end of April, we're going to have a panel discussion. And for I see there are other questions about what do you charge or how reimbursement billing. Um, we cannot discuss a lot of that um, here today, but it honestly, I do bill, Kim does not, and it is possible, but again, there is so much to that discussion. Yes, yes. We actually, we just switched from billable to non-billable for our services, so. Okay, let's go to a different type of question. Yeah. Uh, I may have the opportunity to work in a private practice setting with MedOnc in eastern Pennsylvania. How should I approach pay? Should I be paid hourly, um, consultant versus on staff, versus request a percentage of what we get reimbursed per patient, and if oh, so, what uh, I should I request? I can answer that one too, because that is like a whole lot. But I would highly encourage all the dietitians to go to the eatright.org website, and it's under practice. There's a wealth of information about MNT, private practice, letters to like sample letters to send to your physicians, billing forms, things to do to be prepared for an audit. You name it, it is on there. It's great resources. Okay, well, thank you very much, Heidi and Kim. Um, the rest of the questions that were not answered, we'll go ahead and do this offline and also post um, on our website, the FAQ. Now, before we conclude today's session, I want to remind you to visit our nutrition site for more information on upcoming webinars and podcasts. Finally, please complete the evaluation in order to obtain continuing education credits, which will appear at the end of the session. This concludes the webinar. Thank you all so much for attending, and I hope that the webinar has been beneficial to you and your center.